At the Federal Archives in Koblenz, I wanted to see documents about the London Debt Conference, the reparations agreement between Israel and Germany, both from 1952, and the Operation Business Friend, the secret financing of the Israeli nuclear program by the Adenauer state. These are no historical trivialities. The London Agreement covered different types of German debt from before and after the Second World War. Demands for reparations were deferred forever and a day. This is hard to believe, given the millions of soldiers that were killed during the war. But in Koblenz, I found only a few documents, the text of the agreement, some newspaper articles, but no minutes of the committees or internal correspondence. For Operation Business Friend, I found nothing. I asked where these papers are and received the answer, presumably in the Historical Institute of the Deutsche Bank. Director Hermann Joseph Hobbs had been head of the German delegation in London and had negotiated details with Israel. Hermann Joseph Abs. During the Second World War, he was a member of the board of the Deutsche Bank and was responsible for the Aryanization of Jewish property. While up to six million Jews were murdered in the concentration camps, the Nazi state took possession of their properties, assets, stocks, and companies, a brilliant business for the banking world. After the war, Abs became the close confidant of Chancellor Konrad Adenau, a Catholic like himself. From the mid-1950s, a public relations agency based in the United States transformed the Arianizer of the Deutsche Bank into the Honorable Mr. Banker of Germany. The Deutsche Bank prohibited me from accessing their archives, so I sued the German Federal Archives. Documents related to interstate contracts are official documents that belong to the Federal Archives and not to a private financial institution. The process dragged on for years, ended up at the Constitutional Court and at the end at the Berlin Administrative Court. At the hearing, the bank offered me a settlement. If I declared the matter settled, it would allow me access to the app's legacy. I agreed. The bank is in crisis. The survival of its archive is unclear. I drove to the Frankfurt Ross Market. I was signed the user regulations. At the request of the management of the archive, the user will, before publishing his work, submit the sections based on the documents of the archive and, if necessary, make substantive corrections. I deleted this passage. This documentary is not subject to any previous censorship. Abs came from a Catholic entrepreneurial family. His grandfather was a Royal Prussian Judicial Council. After implementation of the Nuremberg race laws, he became the successor of a Jewish partner in the bank Dulbrich Schickler & Co. and joined the board of Deutsche Bank in 1937, as well as the supervisory board of IG Farben. Abs' career as an Aryanizer is no secret. Little is documented about his activity after the war. The bank was controlling the records. I have seen these files from 1948 to 65 and found there what I had searched for in vain nine years before in the federal archives. Minutes of the committees, correspondence with Adenauer and his ministers, reports, details of the payment obligations. Now I tell this story and show the documents from the Dutch Bank. After the war, Abs had spent three months in Allied custody. He offered the British forces his services as a financial expert and was promptly exonerated. From this moment on, he recovered his career. In 1948, he became head of the new state-owned KFW and in 1957, Deutsche Bank brought him home, back to the board. 
Abs had good contacts with John McCloy, the High Commissioner of the United States and later head of the Chase Manhattan Bank. McCloy was related to the family of Adenauer's wife. The Chancellor had just presented to him an ambitious plan for reconstruction. McCloy was a banker. Jobs interested in him little, but he wanted to submit the young bond state to the logic of the financial economy. On the one hand, we have unemployment. On the other hand, we must constantly be wary of what has so often been disastrous for Germany, namely inflation. A clear dividing line between the central bank and the government is, in my opinion, essential. Still under Allied occupation, ABS established the Committee for International Financial Relations with the cream of German industry. Karl Blessing, Margarine Union, later president of Bundesbank, the German central bank. Dr. Rudolf Brickmann, Wirtz and Company. Karl Goetz, Dresdner Bank. Paul Marx, Commerce Bank. Richard Merton, Metal Company. Waldemar von Oppenheim. Max Schmidt, Paper Industry Waldorf. Walter Schwede, United Steelworks. German industry wanted to become credit worthy again. And so in 1952, three years after the founding of the Federal Republic of Germany, the London Debt Conference was convened. Adenauer did not send his finance minister there, but Abs. Abs did not appreciate the Minister of Economic Affairs, Ludwig Erhard. His point of view completely ignores the facts, because the federal government has already accepted in 1951 the debt. He believes we could promise higher payments in a more dynamic evaluation of the evolution of our economy. Abs decided who he wanted inside the delegation. In addition to his men from the Committee for International Financial Relations, he chose the old-time cliques of Rugas AG, the United Steelworks, the Mine Society, the AEG, the RWE, and the financial expert, Dr. Hoffman. I appreciate him very much. In the 1930s, he was promoted to the HAPAG's Board of Directors as a representative of the National Socialist Party. Someone could feel offended by the fact that he was the bearer of the Golden Party badge when he was engaged in active negotiations on behalf of the federal government. Personally, I would not take offense at this circumstance. The creditors assembled in London took no offense. From the beginning, it was clear that only the debts before the Second World War and after 1945 would be negotiated. An examination of the demands related to World War I will be postponed until the final settlement of the reparation question. The huge damage caused by the German military forces during the war was excluded. I have stated that we cannot settle any debts unless a clause is included, that we assume that outside the regulated claims, no further claims are made against Germany that are not specifically mentioned in the agreement. These words are unusual for the representative of a state that only seven years ago destroyed half of Europe and lost the war. But the United States supported us. They wanted a strong bond state as a bulwark against communism. The Western Allies had promised in the German General Treaty of 1952 not to withdraw reparations from the current industrial production, but to tacitly use the confiscated German foreign assets. With all the painful withdrawals of German foreign assets and patents, as well as with the dismantling of the factories by the Western powers, at least they respected the principle not to demand German reparation from the current production. While official history claims that Germany has not paid reparations to anyone, the Western powers have taken it in this way. For their smaller countries, however, such as Holland or Greece, which had been looted during German occupation, this should not apply, and certainly not for the states of the Eastern Bloc. The major powers represented in the Tripartite Commission have no intentions to demand further reparations from Germany. For political reasons, however, they could not formally renounce future claims for reparation. It was not acceptable to them, for example, that smaller countries sign a bilateral treaty concerning their claims for reparation with the Federal Republic. 
The German foreign assets confiscated as enemy property consisted not only of German schools and companies. It was also about the capital hidden abroad during the war. But in London, nobody wanted to talk about that. The debts of Berlin were postponed to a later date. On the agenda were the loans of the German Reich in Prussia. The Dawes and Young Bonds, the Kruger Bonds, the Lee Higginson Loan, the Prussian International Bonds from 1926 to 27. The reimbursement schedules of these bonds had expired and had to be renegotiated. ABS had listed the pending payment obligations in detail. The gold clause, the interest rate, the international private law, the jurisdiction, and the conversion into the current value would have to be discussed. And he wanted a discount on the repayment sum. Compliance with the final date of the repayment plan exceeds the performance of the federal government. Therefore, a reassessment is required. And further. The calculation of interest areas is difficult as a result of the war-related loss of documents. From 1934 until the beginning of the World War, interest was paid under the bilateral transfer agreements. During the World War, also in neutral creditors like Switzerland and Sweden, partly also to Holland, residues unknown. In 1934, the shipping company, North German Lloyd, negotiated an interest rate cut from its creditors from 6 to 4%. At that time, foreign currency restrictions applied to payments abroad, but the bonds were serviced. The exchange offer was accepted by 99% of the creditors. The promise of the Reichsbank was respected and carried out during the war over Sweden. At the end of the war, their continuation was banned by the Allies. Abs wanted to implement in London the Anglo-American legal concept that in wartime all interest payments would be suspended as the creditor was unintentionally prevented by the front line in the settlement of his debts. But the U.S. banks had secured this case in their lending conditions, as if they had already known in the 20s that a world war was imminent. Bond terms of Dawes, Young, and Kruger included clauses that payment of principal and interest in both war and peacetime terms must be made by each holder regardless of their affiliation with hostile or friendly power. With such clauses, an exemption from interest obligations is evidently impossible. According to the ABS proposal, the Federal Republic should not be liable for more than 50% of the pre-war debt, and he wanted to press the interest rates far below the original pacted. Details he decided alone, sometimes he asked for a cabinet decision. But the ministers were barely able to review his specifications. The largest amount of post-war debt is American post-war aid. He meant the Marshall Plan. The Western Allies signaled that they wanted to reduce their demands to what they called a scale acceptable to the Federal Republic. The reduction offer of the three powers was associated with two conditions namely the satisfactory settlement of the German pre-war debt and a waiver of counterclaims. It concerned demands of the federal government or German citizens against one of the three powers, which could be derived from measures during the occupation time. In London, Abs estimated the German debt to be negotiated at more than 20 billion Deutschmark. In addition, there are the demands from Switzerland and the so-called clearing billion, the claims of Israel and the Jewish organizations of at least 7 billion Deutschmarks, and the demands of Denmark from the refugee assistance. The Swiss clearing billion concerned supplies to the German Reich during the war, food especially, and Denmark wanted money for the supply of German refugees. Abs. We have agreed that Denmark will reduce the claim to 160 billion kroner and pay it off in 20 years without interest. In 1946, the government in Bern had signed the Washington Agreement with the three Western powers that the German assets hidden in Switzerland were liquidated and half-handed over to the Allies. The Swiss wanted to keep the rest. However, there is still an unbridgeable difference between America and Switzerland. The conclusion of the debt agreement depends on overcoming this difference. But all parties wanted an agreement, and Switzerland and the Allies were satisfied with 121 million francs each, 
definitely reparations. The Allies take the amount under the title of reparations. Switzerland accepts it a conto of the regulation of the clearing billion. The Swiss creditors are relentless, Abs complained. Because they are rich enough to be tough. If one speaks of compound interest, high interest rates, and gold clauses, it is always a Swiss. For example, the Swiss wanted to maintain their claims from the Reichmark titles that they had bought during the war from Nazi Germany. In this point, the former Aryanizer of the Deutsche Bank suddenly remembered democratic rules. Mr. Abs has previously pointed out that there is no apparent interest in giving special consideration to Swiss creditors who have supported German warfare by subscribing to Reichsmark titles. Creditors from 31 countries discuss the German debt tower. A fulfillment of the maximum wishes of the creditors is completely excluded. We said this clearly to the creditors in all our negotiations. Up to 200 representatives were present at the plenary sessions and the working committees consisted of 16 creditors and five Germans. Committee A negotiated the public debts of the German Reich and Prussia. Committee B, the loans and credits of the private sector. Committee C, the standstill loans. And Committee D, the rest, such as uncovered commodity debt and private mortgage debt. The standstill loans concerned the financial injections from 1931 in the middle of the German banking crisis. The creditors have argued that Germany owe the currency at the time of loan that is, the gold clause. Further interests, according to contractors, and interest rates of 4%, where no interest has been fixed. Abs demanded deductions. An interest rate that is about 3%, and, after the debts of the German Reich, are reduced by half, a reduction of capital, a payback to a moderate percentage, but only after a grace period of three or four years, and by no means exceeding the Italian regulation, which provides for a 2% amortization. In February 1953, the debt agreement was signed. ABS had knocked out a substantial discount of the nearly 30 billion Deutsche Mark, which had been at the beginning of the debate. Only half remained, which could be settled with generous due dates. Repairs for the millions of war victims were, as I said, not the subject of deliberations in London. They were put on hold until the conclusion of a peace treaty. This contract does not exist up until this day. The 2 plus 4 treaty signed in 1990 merely regulates the reunification of Germany. To this day, the federal government rejects demands for payment of reparations with reference to the London Agreement. The Soviet Union and the states of the Eastern Bloc did not sign it. Only reparations were paid for the extermination of European Jews. The U.S. government did not want to be the only one to subsidize the young state of Israel and had made it clear to Adenau that he could not file the issue. The bill went up. Until 1962, Germany delivered goods with a value of 2.9 billion Deutsche Mark, the Israeli Foreign Exchange Control Office calculated. The Swiss newspaper, NZZ, compared these reparations with the economic aid from the USA which had amounted to only $600 million in the same period, less than the payments from the Federal Republic. German Reparation and American Economic Aid to Israel. Abs filed that article in his folder, Loans with Israel. One month after the beginning of the London Conference, the Federal Republic met with representatives of Israel and the Jewish Claims Conference in The Hague. The federal government believes that the negotiation in the Hague will take place in two phases. First, the German delegation wants to confine itself to know the demands of Israel and the Jewish organizations. The result would then be forwarded to the London Debt Conference. As soon as the London Conference has finalized its negotiations on the inclusion of the Israeli debt complex into an overall settlement of German debt, the second phase of the Hague will discuss the question of payment modalities. The federal government appointed law professor Franz Baum as head of delegation and Adenau ordered him to be a close contact with ABS. If we succeed in reconciling Judaism, at least its most important men, 
we can count on economic aid to a greater extent than if the abrupt contrast persists. I am also motivated by our moral obligation that we have towards Judaism. Of course, the result of our negotiations in London should not be affected. The top priority in both London and The Hague was the restoration of German creditworthiness. Abs told Adenau what he had to do. Today, a representative of Israel will visit you. They want to hear from you a statement concerning the handling of the restitution of Israel. They erroneously consider that deliveries in German goods will not rise the transfer problem. Abs, not Baum, had the final say. The Israelis turned directly to him and talked Turkey. They declared that the conference in The Hague must necessarily lead to a positive result. Otherwise, the Israeli government would be in great trouble. The organization does not shrink from terrorist actions. Otherwise, American Jewry is extremely influential in the United States, which is also important for the relationship between the United States and Germany. These remarks are not a threat, but they want to be clear. In London, Abs had estimated the Jewish demands at 12 billion Deutsche Mark, but Nachem Goldman of the World Jewish Congress reduced his claims to 3 to 4 billion, including compensation for individuals. Abs offered Goldman the use of the seized German foreign assets in the United States. He had positively received this proposal, he wrote to Adenau. In addition, he is planning a long-term bond in the U.S., whose revenues would completely benefit Israel. This proposal also received a positive response by Dr. Goldman. Such a loan could only come about if we get a satisfactory solution of the German international credit worthiness. Therefore, I believe that it is in Israel's very best interest to contribute to the success of the London Debt Conference. Abs contradicted Goldman's claim that Adenauer had mentioned a grant for 500,000 displaced German Jews. There are not 500,000 German Jews. I am well aware that there is no such recognition made by the federal government. It will be essential to point out Dr. Goldman's erroneous perception. In May 1952, Av submitted a draft to the chief negotiator Baum, the state secretary, and the assistant secretary. Payment should be planned for a period of 12 years, those to the state of Israel, as well as those to the claims conference, speaking for the Jewish organizations. Abs considers higher payments than $200 million annually as unreasonable for the first two years. Later, maybe $250 million. Consent was reached referring to the total amount of $3 billion Deutsche Mark for Israel. Abs insisted on a quick repayment and refused repayments in foreign currency. Shortly after 12, Messrs. Goldman and Shinar appeared. Whether they can imagine a temporary solution, the round asked. Goldman said to have answered. Temporary solution only to create a transition to the final solution. That's what the minutes say. The words final solution were probably still solidly planted in the brains of officials and bankers. Goldman wanted to shorten the term, but accepted deliveries of goods and gas from England. Abs argued that he had to spend half of it in foreign currency and reported strong concerns. Felix Schinar, who represented the Israeli government, proposed a joint action with the English authorities. Goldman politely recalled half a billion for the Jewish organizations. Abs again reported concerns that it is still to be reckoned with substantial individual claims for reimbursement. He estimated another $2.5 billion. In September 1952, the agreement was signed. Again, they avoided the word reparations and instead spoke of an aid for the integration of displaced Jewish refugees. The Federal Republic promised the payment of $3.5 billion Deutsche Mark, $50 million for persecuted persons who were not Jewish because of their faith, but only because of the Nuremberg Laws, $450 million for the displaced Jews living outside of Israel, and $3 billion for Israel, transacted by the Israel Mission in Cologne. Shinar was born in Stuttgart as Felix Schirnenbach, son of a wealthy businessman. He studied law and became managing director of a trust company. 
1934, he immigrated to Palestine, where he headed the Israel Discount Bank. In the foreign ministry, he built up the department Jewish Claims Against Germany. For 14 years, until 1966, he headed as an ambassador extraordinary the Israel mission in Cologne. He knew from the negotiations on the reparation agreement that all threads of the German government came together in the office of ABS when it came to money. For Shinar, that made a clear case for cultivating a special relationship with him. Therefore, he provided the banker with huge fruit boxes, of course, from Israel. I would like to thank you for this kindness. The oranges and grapefruits are a welcome change on the menu and an extra vitamin fortification. That was probably a common practice at the time. Even Adenauer asked Abs for personal favors. On the 2nd of September, my son Conrad turns 50 years old. Would it be possible to appoint him as an ordinary member of the executive board on this day? You would do him and me a great favor. Abs helped again and again. I would be very grateful if you could help my son Conrad. He would like to assume more responsibility. You are very devoted, Adenauer. I found in these records not a single reference of Abs ever dealing with his activities during the National Socialism. Not a word of regret or an apology. Shinar had organized a trip to Israel for Abs and his wife in 1959. There he did not visit memorial sites, but as he wrote, the ancient sites of Christianity. Loans to the Israeli arms industry, Abs handled through the Cologne branch of the bank. Strictly confidential. The Israeli military industries is directly under the authority of the Israeli Ministry of Defense. It supplies weapons to our Federal Office of Defense Technology in Koblenz. Hand grenades, submachine guns with equipment and ammunition. The company asked us for an advance payment of the contracts. Abs gave the green light, but repudiated new credit request. I have actually no opinion referring these requests. No, underlined, exclamation mark, although the transaction was profitable. We made so far 873,000 Deutschmarks on interest. He exchanged views on critical reporting with the Israel mission. What you wrote in your article, Grenades from Haifa, is, as far as you refer to Israel and the reparation agreement, completely wrong and has no basis in fact. These weapon deals had been heavily criticized in Israel, arms deliveries to the country of the murderers. Schiener brought Abs together with the influential banker, Baron Rothschild. The gentlemen exchanged their opinions at dinner. Abs returned the favor and sent the Israeli diplomat to the German bank KFW, which was to finance the Israeli nuclear program. Israel spared no effort to acquire the atomic bomb. But at that time, the U.S. did not want nuclear weapons in the Middle East, and the Soviet Union supported Egypt. So Joseph Kohn, the European representative of the Weizmann Institute of Science, sought contact with Adenauer, and he sent him to ABS along with a former employee of the BASF, the former IG Farben. That man wanted to build a physical institute in the Holy Land. And what a coincidence, Abs had just visited the Weissman Institute. I have had the audacity to let you know through your office that I am thinking with many wishes on your recent decision. In March 1960, Adenauer met with Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion in New York and assured him of his support for the Israeli nuclear program, know-how, and a lot of money. After returning from New York, Adenauer told Abs, Mr. Cohen has asked me to support his requests of a greater promoting of the Weissmann Institute from the private German industry, and I am glad to do so. It was about loans from the federal government and the industry. The banker was not amused. Ben-Gurion informed Shinad, who talked with me, he had told me that Mr. Ben-Gurion is wishing a German contribution of about 40 to $50 million a year, totaling between 1.7 and 2.1 billion Deutschmark, motivated by moral but also political and economic considerations you have agreed in general. Abs had to accept the project as a serious German challenge. Ben-Gurion's wishes were justified, 
and the reparation ends in five years. Nevertheless, these wishes of Israel are in their absolute magnitude very high and require a very careful examination. In the record, Loans with Israel, I found two letters from Abs to Adenauer dated June 29, 1960. In the first one, Abs summarizes the agreement of the operation Business Friend and criticized the amount of the payments. In the second letter, Abs is angry about the Israeli trickery. In the matter of the new Israeli loan, I would like to explain that neither through the talks held in Israel in the spring of 1959, nor in any other way did I offer the Israeli Prime Minister Ben-Gurion or any third party an opportunity to appeal to me. It is unclear whether the second letter has been sent and the file is the original. Anyway, Adenauer had decided and provided $3 million from the budget of the Atomic Ministry. He did not even inform his own cabinet on the Operation Business Friend. The Weissman Institute will receive $3 million from federal funds through the Max Planck Institute. It had been considering assigning research contracts to the Institute by the German industry. However, the chairman of the Institute does not consider this support to be opportune for psychological reasons. The German-Israeli relationship had not progressed so far. Ab set up a special account with the Deutsche Bank for the Weizmann Institute, and Shinar was authorized to use it. Ben-Gurion was satisfied. At the end of September, he wrote at an hour. You are the man who felt and realized that the German people as a whole bears the moral responsibility for the appalling tragedy. Your action motivated by moral consideration, was unparalleled. I wish you health and a long life. With the three million Deutsche Mark, the nuclear plans of the Weizmann Institute could not be financed. I don't know to abs. We cannot resist this wish. The budget committee of the Bundestag will therefore approve a new allocation of one million in the fiscal year 1961. The payment of another two million is planned. Now, a donation from the industry would have to be added. Obviously, German-Israeli relations had progressed so far. As proposed, for reasons of discretion, the state bank, KFW, and drummed up some German industrial magnets. The list of the Weizmann supporters includes numerous companies that had made high profits during the Third Reich with the extermination of the Jews. AEG, Bayer, Hust. Degusa. At the end of 1960, the Bank of Israel confirmed that it had deposited Israeli government bonds in Deutsche Bank's custody account. The operation Business Friend ended when Adenauer left office. In total, KFW paid Israel 630 million Deutsche Mark without a decision from the cabinet and without informing the parliament. The meeting between Adenauer and Ben-Gurion had been arranged by a certain Julius Klein. This is not in the history books, but in the Av's legacy. Klein had fought in both world wars, was a member of the Zionist Organization of America, and probably the most expensive lobbyist based in Chicago. Among his best customers were the German industrialists, who wanted to do business again in the USA from the early 50s on and realized that they, until recently loyal supporters of Adolf Hitler, had a severe image problem. The retired Jewish U.S. general promised relief. It was indeed a pleasure realizing that you are fully aware of the problems facing German industry in the U.S. He wrote Abs, and the banker understood. In September 1955, the two met in Bonn, where Klein's services were also in demand. For example, by Hans Speil, during Second World War, as Lieutenant General, who had raged and occupied France against the resistance and the Jews. The Speil became head of the entire armed forces in the German Ministry of Defense and, from 1957 on, Commander-in-Chief of the NATO Land Forces in Central Europe, Klein was not really innocent. Proudly, he wrote to the dear Dr. Abs, the PhD was pure invention. 
of parties with the German foreign minister and the good common friend General Speidel, for whom he also put a good word. In a conspiratorial manner, he presented his plans to Abs. I am dictating this note to my confidential secretary. There are no carbon copies, and I wish you not to retain this letter either, but destroy it. You are Mr. Banker of Germany. Like the names of Morgan or our good friend John McCloy are the symbol of U.S. banking to our people here. So have you taken the place of all German bankers in your own hemisphere? I will work on your personal buildup from which you will receive the worldwide recognition Do you as Germany's coming strongman. I believe in you. Of course, the PR program had its price. An annual retainer fee of $75,000 plus expenses and $20,000 per year for a senior account executive and his secretarial staff. The terms of the contractual agreement was to be for three years with rising expenditure. Klein accounted expenses for the first year between ten and $15,000. A good deal, the lobbyists assured. An American association of comparable size would consider $250,000. The deal was struck. Klein knew about Abs' activities in the Aryanization of Jewish property, and he had not escaped the rumors that Abs in 1952 had been against the satisfaction of Jewish claims. It had to be worked on. So he suggested Abs to write a personal report on his so positive attitude toward reparation. Abs declined. Such a report could miss its effect, he said. On the other hand, I would like to suggest that you inquire in Jewish circles who participated in the negotiations at the time, for example, connecting Dr. Goldman and Dr. Shinar. Abs also added a letter from Goldman and from Shinar. Klein got the requested information that he regards Abs as one of the staunch supporters of Israel. Klein arranged for Abs, not without ulterior motive, the meeting with Ben Gurion and the tour of the Weizmann Institute, which worked on the atomic bomb. The Prime Minister thanked Klein for that direct contact. We had a stimulating conversation, and I was very impressed by Mr. Abs' obvious goodwill and deep understanding of our problems. Not the Federal Press Office but Klein prepared the state visit of Chancellor Adenauer in the U.S. His assistant, a retired Major General, sent to the Chancellery information about anti-Semitism to the hands of Hans Globke, Adenauer's right hand, and is a commentator of the Nuremberg race laws, specialist in the matter. Axel Springer, the almighty publisher, received copies. The Chancellor should now stand calm and relax. On this trip, he should only be accompanied by his daughter. The Chancellor should consider whether he does not want to make an unofficial last visit to his faithful comrade Dulles. One hand washed the other. When Klein wanted to buy a Mercedes-Benz, Abs called the Daimler Agency in North America and got a demonstration car for him at a reduced price. Klein was a Republican and in 1960 delegate for his party. His close friend, United Nations Ambassador to the United States, Cabot Lodge, was designated by Richard Nixon as Vice President. The freedom of Berlin is guaranteed more securely by Nixon than by the Democratic adversary. Klein was convinced that Nixon would win the elections. This was doomed to him because at the polls, John F. Kennedy won. Klein lost his contacts in the government and was out of business. No one was interested in his general anti-communist hot air about the red danger. After the establishment of diplomatic relations between Vaughn and Tel Aviv, the Israel mission in Cologne was dissolved. Felix Schienar maintained close contact with Abs. In February 1968, he called him at Deutsche Bank. It was about Walter Grab a historian at the University of Tel Aviv. Details are not mentioned in the note, but Shinar had collected information about the historian. Grab belonged to the extreme left, Shinar said. He himself would immediately take care of that case after his arrival in Israel and think about what actions should be taken against Dr. Grab. The measures are not described in the document, but apparently they have been executed for the satisfaction of Deutsche Bank. 
At that time, Shinar was 62 years old and still working for the Israeli government. A few weeks later, he got back to Abs, this time in private matter. He wanted to work for him after his return to Israel, not as a representative of Deutsche Bank, but as a consultant. The bank was interested. Of course, it would also be part of your job to intervene on behalf of Deutsche Bank in Israeli government offices. So the diplomat, who had closed the deal concerning reparation in the operation Business Friend, now is on the payroll of the bank. Abs had proposed an annual fee of $6,000. The consulting relationship can be terminated with a three-month notice period, and you do not have any pension claims to us from this activity. Shinar increased to $7,500 plus $1,500 for expenses. Foreign travel would be charged separately. The employment began on October 1st, when it ended is not in the file. Shinar died in 1985 in Tel Aviv. Abs lived until his death in 1994 in Kronberg in a house with 1,200 square meters of living space. This villa had once been built for Fritz T. Mird, board member of IG Fardwin. Unlike Abs, he was sentenced as a war criminal to seven years in prison for enslaving forced laborers in Auschwitz, the concentration camp. The legacy of Abs is still stored in the historical institute of Deutsche Bank. The share price of the bank fell. Whether it survives the crisis is uncertain. What will happen if a U.S. investor takes over the bank? What will they do with this valuable archive? These documents that have been stored there since the beginning of the bank are about their investments in all the world, about the Baghdad Railway, about their investments in the South African apartheid regime and the Nazi money laundering in Argentina. Money business is done in plain language. The archive of Deutsche Bank is indispensable for the reconstruction of our history. It should be transferred to the Federal Archives.